Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming and welcome. I'm Doris Wise Montrose. I'm president of Children of Jewish Holocaust Survivors. We thank the David Horowitz Freedom Center for their co-sponsorship, and we are grateful to the Lux Hotel for their generosity in helping to make this event possible. Our guest tonight, Philippe Carsante, has become justly celebrated as the man who single-handedly defied the entire French media, the political establishment, and the intellectual body, which closed ranks to defend the official version of what happened on September 30, 2000, at the Natsarim Junction in Gaza. That only one person took this case on is sadly a pathetic and frightening commentary for all of us to reflect on. We are always asking what we can do. One, we can help Mr. Carsante, and second, we should all try to do what he did, as reflected by Mr. Carsante. One of the most important things to do is fight for the truth. This is not for the Jews or for Israel, it's for democracy. Democracy is not just about voting. If the media is bringing you lies and we don't react, that is insane. Ask yourself why freedom of speech is the first thing to be attacked and stifled. If we lose our freedom of speech, truth is the first victim of our democracy. Let us hope Mr. Carsante's courageous account will ignite a sense of urgency in each of us so that we can all join in and do whatever we can to preserve our precious freedom. Now it is with great honor that I present to you Mr. Philippe Carsante. Thank you very much, Doris. Thank you to everybody. I'm very happy to be in, in, in L.A. Uh, well, you know, L.A. has been my headquarters of La Résistance when I started this fight. I started this fight eight years ago. And uh, any time I, I felt uh, sad, I felt kind of sorrow in Paris, I, I came back to L.A. and I get strength. So I'm very, very happy to be here. So, um, do all of you know this picture? Okay, so it's 10 years ago. Friends to the French public TV, uh, friends to uh, air this news, this picture, which is the last picture of the news report. Uh, it was this picture which triggered the second intifada, and it's also this picture which has been used by Bin Laden in the year prior to 9-11 to incite against Israel, the Jews, and the Western world. It has been also the picture which has been used to justify the beheading of Daniel Pearl. So, and you'll see later on. You won't see the ugly scene, but you will see part of this. So it's a very important picture, which will really change the face of the 21st century. Uh, what you will see now, it's not uh, one theory against the other theory. This is a demonstration that we've been able to prove in two courts of justice in, French, in France, and also uh, in all the universities where I've been invited, I would say, all over the world, from South Africa to India to Turkey, almost all the countries in Europe and, of course, in the United States. Um, I'm not the one who discovered the truth. It's very important to insist on that. I did not discover the truth. It was discovered by an Israeli scientist whose name is Nahum Shaf and another guy whose name is Yosef Doriel. who discovered it. And uh, I used to be a stockbroker and to be in business, so I had nothing to do with the media. And in 2002, when I realized that they were right, that it was a hoax, and, but that they were not able to convey their message, I decided to took it on and to have it corrected. I thought it was going to be easy, but it was not easy <laughs> at all. And after two years of uh, really uh, failure, I decided to be provocative against France too because be between 2002 and 2004, I went to the Israelis and I asked them, look, it's a hoax, please do your job make them admit it's a hoax. And they looked at me and they said, no, it's not a hoax. <laughs> Please leave us alone with that. So I went further. I really tried. I gathered more evidence, more and more and more. And finally, in 2004, when I realized that the Israelis weren't willing to fight, when I realized that nobody wanted to fight this, I decided to publish a very provocative article in order to be sued by France too. And it worked perfectly. I published this suit two weeks later. Good. So uh, then I was in the problem because I had to gather more and more evidence in order, in order to, def to defend myself. So what I will show you now is maybe 
30% of the evidence that I have. And of course, later on, if you have questions, I will answer your question and I'll be able to look into my computer for some more material. Uh, the presentation will last around between 35 to 40 minutes. And uh, please keep all your questions at the end, it's very important. And I'll give you more, de more details about what's, being, what's happening, what happened recently in the case. Um, Yes, well, I think uh, I told you most of the thing I had to tell you before. Um, maybe we could turn off the lights. It would be great. Especially this one. Can we turn off the light? Yeah. Ah. Is it okay? Yes. Okay. So, let's watch it, please, carefully. So it has been aired on September 30, 2000, 10 years ago. My claim, I insist on that, my claim is that 100% of what you're going to, to see is completely staged. Actors, non-professional actors, it's 50 seconds of staging. Okay, now we have a problem with the sound. So this is the last picture. So let's take a look at what is the version of the fact of France 2. First, they said that the soldiers were at a distance of 80 meters from the boy and the father. So if you remember the fixed target of the boy and the father, like two square meters, at 80 meters, just asking you a question, how long should it take to any soldier in the world to shoot this target? One, two bullets. Let's listen to them. They pretend that the Israeli soldiers shot at them for 45 minutes. Okay. Then they said that the boy was shot and killed with three bullets and that the father got to 12 bullets and was injured. If you just take a look at the last picture, 15 bullets altogether, but not a single drop of blood. Okay. I mean, you're laughing and everybody laughs now, but you have to realize that 10 years ago, all of us, you and I, have been manipulated all over the world, even the IDF, even the State of Israel, everybody was manipulated because when you watch TV, you don't watch to TV, you listen to TV and the, the, the voiceover tells you what you have to, what you, you will see and you believe what you will hear, but you don't realize that you're, this is not what you're going to see. So first I will show you what has been the worldwide exploitation of this case, then you, you'll see who are the main characters, why France 2 version of the fact is inconsistent and your questions and my answers. So let's take a look at how it has been exploited. First you had these kind of cartoons in the newspapers. Then you had postage stamps. It's interesting because it's becoming more professional and what you can see is that they're using always a mosque, you know, or the map of the state of Israel that represented to be Palestine. It's really it's really being used in terms of politics, you know, they're using it in a political way. And you have countries like Iran or Sudan, but you also have Jordan and Egypt. Then you have the recruitment tape of bin Laden, which has been really inciting before 9-11. <laughs> So 
Then you had buildings all over the world. You have the martyr, Ministry of Health, Martyr Mohammed al Dura in Gaza. Then you have this kind of buildings like in Iran. And this is part of the video clip of Daniel Pearl. You will not see the ugly scene, but you will see that the justification for the killing is the so called death of Mohammed al Dura. Uh, der amerikanische Journalist Daniel Pearl war Jude. Seine Henkerzwangen in Israel als Kindermörder anzuprangern. Wenige Minuten später trennten sie ihm von laufender Kamera den Kopf ab und stellten die Bilder ins Internet. You see that on the left hand side you can see stop, you see the father, stop, it's written stop killing Palestinian children. So it has been used by Pakistani terrorists and it also been used by Marwan Barghouti, stop killing Palestinian children. You know, so from all the terrorists from all over the world they've been using this kind of picture to incite against the Jews. Here you have it in Lebanon, you can see the Hezbollah flag. You see the size of this child, so you can imagine the size of the poster. And they added Israeli soldier shooting at them. And this is the major square of Bamako in, in Africa, capital of Mali. They told me that for them it's like Times Square. So it's a real modern blood libel. And it's very important to understand in each generation we've been, uh, the Jews have been insulted and slandered and the result was more and more killings. And this is why we still need to defend against this lie, this blood libel, because this has been killing people, hundreds and thousands of people all over the world. But it will kill and kill again because it's used all over the Muslim world and I'm telling you, even in Europe and in the Western world, it's used against Israel. If you have, when you have demonstration at UC Irvine or any other American universities, they are always using this picture. So who are the main characters? First, you have Talal Abu Rahmah, he's a, uh, an Arab cameraman living in Gaza. At the time, he was also working for CNN. When he got his material, he sent it to CNN, and CNN refused to air it because they said it doesn't look authentic. But he sent it also to Charles Anderlin, who's, um, I would say, the most important French journalist when it comes to Middle East. He's a French-Israeli journalist. He made Aliyah 40 years ago. And uh, he's really uh, a big figure in France. Last year, Nicolas Sarkozy offered him the Legion of Honor. Uh, ten days ago, he has just published, no, I said, no, sorry, t not ten days, a month ago, sorry, a month ago, he has published a book in France and the, tit the name of the book is A Child Was Killed so it's a 200 pages book concerning this story where he always repeats, repeats his lies my name is mentioned 114 times in the book so big publicity for me as you can imagine after he has published his book he's been in all the French networks all the French newspaper everywhere he's been everywhere nobody ever let me answer and last week he got he was awarded a book prize for his book so he's really still at the top of the hill in France but we have still have some other people who are with me but he's really really well respected I'll come later on about the trials but you also need to know that the last trial I won against him when I won the trial Le Nouvel Observateur which is the largest French weekly issued a petition in support of me and against me it was signed by, by 800 journalists, just that you understand who is he and that I'm really under him in terms of reputation. Okay. So now Friends 2. What is Friends 2? Uh, Friends 2, it's the French public TV. It's the voice of the French government. So it's very important to understand that this blood libel is a state-sponsored blood libel. And Jamal al Dura is a man who claimed that he got 12 bullets and was not killed. And you'll see later on what it says. So, now I'd like to address one of you, your question that may come later on, and which is one of the argumentation of uh, Friends too. They say, how can you imagine that we're staging scenes when in the middle of a war? It makes sense, you know, how can you imagine that they will stage something when people are really shooting at them? And what I'm going to show you now is that there was no shooting at that day. It was only staging. So let me show you where it happened. Here you have the wall and the barrel here. Here, here you have the Israeli stronghold at a distance of 80 meters and you have a sharp angle of 30 degrees. What I'm going to show you now 
our cameraman here filming in this direction. So they're filming scenes which are here and afterwards which are here. Okay, so let's take a look at it. So you're here. Here you see the Israeli flag. Just here. So they're turning their back to the barrel. So the boy fell. The ambulance is coming now. The cameramen also are coming. And take a look at this, this boy, what he's doing. He's applauding and smiling. So he's turning his back to the Israeli, taking lots of risk, and he's not afraid and he's so happy that his friend is wounded that he smiles and applauds. And you see you have all these cameramen and you have this man with a machine gun. You would believe that this man is in danger because the Israeli would like to kill him. Nobody shoots at him and nobody shot at anybody. You have to understand that the Israelis are here. So all these guys, if they were really shooting at them, would be fantastic targets. Let's take a second one. Could you speak a little slower? A little slower? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Just ask. I will sleep slower. <laughs> this is the ambulance. Here you have someone riding his bicycle and here the man doesn't need to be carried. He runs inside the ambulance. <laughs> Okay, now this is an evacuation of another guy, wounded guy, but you will see that it goes too fast. <laughs> so now he's really wounded. <laughs> this is, these are scenes which are filmed at the same area on the same day by Reuters and AP. So now let's take a look at another. I have many other scenes, but I like I've chosen four of these scenes. Let's take a look at this guy. You're going to see someone running and pretendously receiving a bullet while running. So if he really received a bullet, all these guys would be in big danger. But no, everybody is quiet. Nobody cares. Quietly, the ambulance arrives quite fast. And then the ambulance will start again. On the right hand side you will see three cameramen and journalists talking quietly. Just on the right hand side of the screen. Here. Okay, and here is a triple jump, the triple jump of the man. Nobody seems to worry for their life. Okay. So all these scenes were fake. It's very important just to understand that what we're dealing here is Hollywood, Palestinian Hollywood. Just faking scenes just for the camera. And this is what you're seeing most of the time on TV. So let's take a look at the first scene of the France 2 News report. Because you can say, OK, yes, they were faking a scene before, they were faking scenes before the real event, but you could say, well, but the, what they were filming afterwards was real. So let's take a look at the first scene of the Friends to News report. Let's take a look at it. Okay, so here we have three incredible things. First, it's the first time in your life that you'll see someone an anonymous guy being filmed while receiving a bullet and filmed live on TV. The first time you have a cameraman who knows exactly that the man will be the hero of the day. <coughs> and there is a second thing which is incredible is that the ambulance comes in two seconds. <laughs> I don't know who in this room I have to thank but someone got a phone call in this room and thank to this person you realize that it took more than two seconds to pick up the phone. But for the ambulance, it takes more or less than to pick up the phone. So it's re completely ridiculous, you know, you understand what I mean? Yeah. And the third thing is that the camera, the, the voiceover said that the Palestinians are shooting live ammunition. You see? Okay, why? Do sometimes the Palestinians don't shoot li uh, real ammunition? You know, they are they faking also scenes? So he claimed that they're shooting live ammunition. So I told you that it was very rare to have someone 
filming someone who received the bullet. But you will see that there is a second cameraman who was filming the same guy from another angle. So two cameramen knew exactly that this man was going to be the hero at the day that day. And then he jumps on this direction, which is not logical. He should be pushed towards the jeep because he, he received the bullet from the Israeli side that way. And on the right hand side, what you can see is that the ambulance started even before he got the bullet. Watch it here. So he complains and he pretends that he got a bullet on the right leg. So they will drag him on the floor on the right leg. No blood. They will carry him on the right leg. No blood. They will put him on the stretcher on the right leg. No complaint. I told you that there were two cameramen. I was not telling the truth. There were a third cameraman. There was a third cameraman. Here he has the ambulance, the jeep. And this guy was not very well positioned, so you couldn't see the evacuation, but you could see, on the contrary, that the boy and the father here were already waiting for their scene behind the barrel. And you'll see later on, and you even see the tripod in front of them, before them, but you'll see later on that, they, that you'll see them much better. You can't see them very well, but you'll see them much better later on. So you can say that the first scene of the France 2 News report is not authentic. And that's problematic because you see that the boy and the father are appearing in this scene. So that's quite strange. Let's take the third question, which is what became of the bullets and what was the source of the alleged gunfire? So have you ever heard of any journalist going to any NGO to testify of what he has seen? Never. So this man went to the Palestinian Center for Human Rights and he testified under oath three days later that he spent approximately 27 minutes photographing the incident which took place for 45 minutes. Let me stop here. 27 minutes of photographing. For seven years we've been begging the French t public TV to bring the 27 minutes. We said, look, you claim that you have 27 minutes to substantiate your claim that the boy was killed. Bring them to the court or bring them at least before even the trial. And they said, no, no, no. At the first trial, I had a first trial in 2006 um, when, uh, when I was sued. Uh, at the trial, I brought some of the evidence you're seeing here and they didn't bring any evidence. They just brought a letter of Jacques Chirac, who at that time was a French president supportive of Charles Anderling, the French journalist, and written testimonials from other cameramen. And at the end of the trial, the government advisor said that I was right. I brought enough evidence it was staged. But a month later, I was found guilty of defamation. It was probably the influence of the Jacques Chirac's letter. I appealed, and a year later, the trial started again in September 2007. And what was amazing is that at this moment, the judge started to understand the story, and they interrupted the trial and said, wait a minute, it doesn't make sense. You're claiming that you're having these 27 minutes. Bring them to the court. So they interrupted the trial, and they say, in two months, we are going to watch the tapes at the court. So this was a real turning point. We were very, very excited. And two months later, instead of bringing 27 minutes, they brought only 18 minutes. So they tampered with it. They, they deleted nine minutes of the tape. And at the trial, we could see that in these 18 minutes, there was 17 minutes of nothing, just ridiculous scene, 50 seconds of what you've seen here, 10 other seconds that you will see later on, and three more seconds which are even more ridiculous, but you'll see them later on. So this is very important to have this guy who has testified for 27. And he also said that he confirmed that the boy uh, was killed intentionally and in cold blood, and that his father was injured. So a year later, he was interviewed by a German TV, and the German TV had him telling him what he thought about, the, uh, about the, what happened that day. I never saw shooting in my life. 45 minutes shooting in the boy. So he confirms 45 minutes shooting in the boy. So let's listen to him when, when the journalist asks him more about the shooting. I'm sorry, so there is a problem with the sound now. She asked, uh, now you're not on stereo, you're just on one, one track. You don't have, yeah, let me try again. There were many bullets. Hundreds, hundreds. Yeah, there's some uh, uh, 
بوليس هيد بابك بابك ناس أصلاً مين عليك أوكي لو لو كان ده هو ديرز أوقات البوليس أبان ده هو يلا أي كاونت فورتي أول ده هو أولي فورتي so first he said hundreds of bullets then at the end he said 40 40 after 45 minutes of shooting not a lot I mean it's less than one per minute let's take a look at the last picture you have eight bullet holes okay eight bullet holes not even one each five minutes so when you see the shape of these bullet holes can you imagine if the father had tw um, 12 bullets like that 12 holes like that okay and what you can see is that the bullet holes are round. There is a problem now, I'm sorry with the sound, it's unpleasant. Can you do something with the sound? Can you put it back because it's... it's no, no. We, uh, it's yeah. Yeah. Hello? Yeah. Okay, so uh, you see the shape of the hole in the wall are round which proved that the shooting is perpendicular. It were, if it were coming from the Israeli side, from where I would be, you would see oval shapes on the wall, not round bullet holes. So what you can see with these eight bullet holes which are round, you can be sure that all of them were coming from the Palestinian side, not from the Israeli side. Another thing is that the Israelis were, according to them, were firing from this direction. But what you can see, which is incredible, after the father supposedly received 12 bullets, he didn't move from one centimeter, you know. He should be pushed towards the left a little bit after 12 bullets like that. So now let's listen to Charles Anderlin. As I said, he's the most respected French journalist when it comes to music. Listen to him. All the witnesses, I talked to, uh, told me the shooting was coming from the direction or from the Israeli position itself. So. Okay, so all the witnesses told him that the bullet came from the Israeli position. So, at the trial, as I told you, we got written testimonials from his witnesses. Let's take a look at them. Israeli soldiers were firing missiles. <laughs> a plane was firing at them from overhead. There were helicopters, Israeli snipers, firing anti-tank missiles. Despite all of that, eight bullet holes and not a single drop of blood. Sorry. So now what I will show you, I'd like to, you to understand exactly where we are now. Let's pretend that this is the barrel. The father is here, the boy is here. One meter on the left, you have, I mean on the right, sorry, on the left for you, but for me on the right, you have a Reuters cameraman who's filming and you're going to see what he's filming now and another cameraman working for AP two meters on the right hand side so now just imagine that the cameraman on his left hand side at one meter he has the boy and the father you'll see their hands and you'll hear them sorry so we are in front of the Israelis so can you imagine back on the wall here so the ambulance stops quietly and you're in front of the Israeli compound here. You know, the ambulance stops. The guy rides his bicycle. Here you have four guys waiting in front of the Israelis. They are not in danger, according to them. You know, they, are not, they don't feel very stressed. You hear the guns, the machine guns noise or the guns noise. Here you see the barrel. On the left hand side you can see the barrel. You see here the barrel. The jeep is coming and here you see the father pushing the, the, the stone and here's this man having a phone call here. The, the jeep goes. This man goes out, down from his bicycle. The stone, the barrel. All this noise, always a noise. And now you'll hear the boy and the father talking. Okay. So you can tell me, okay, but we've not seen precisely the boy and the father. You've seen a hand and you've heard something. Now you'll see from the guy from AP, which is two meters on the, uh, on the left for you, and on the right for me, you'll see them. So here's filming here. On the left hand side you can see the blue and white shirt of the boy here. So you see? You can see them, you can see the foot of the boy. The ambulance, the jeep here. You see the boy and the, the boy here? 
Okay, and another guy comes here, so nobody is afraid, you know. This guy would be really under fire if, were, if the Israelis were shooting. So all of this is the Israeli compound here, all this. And you know, all these guys are in front of the Israelis and nobody's shooting at them. But you will see the last picture, which is very interesting. What can you see in the last picture? Just in front of the Israelis, when they pretendously are shooting at everybody to kill everybody, you can see that a guy with his tripod here, and filming, and with his assistant. So we are really not in a scene where there is war. So no Israeli bullets were shot towards the Eldora. You can see this from ballistics. I forgot to tell you that we, had, we hired a ballistic expert, the most prominent guy in France, and he gave us a report, 90 pages report on, on ballistics, which explains that no bullet, no Israeli, Israeli bullet were shot towards the Eldora. So now the two last questions. What happened to Jamal, the father, and what happened to Mohammed, the boy? Were they shot in front of friends to cameramen? So let's listen to the father. So his lower body and his arm were full of bullets. You can see his lower body here and his arm. But the day after, he has blood on the cast, here, here, a red blood. So at this stage, we had a kind of a problem because in 2004, when we really started to argue very badly with them, they took pictures of the father naked, and we could see that he has scars under his uh, bandages. So that was a big problem. We had to justify and find a, an explanation for these scars. And we finally understood, in 19, this happened in 2000. In 1992, the father was working in Israel and he was considered as a collaborator by the Arabs. So he's been assaulted by the people from the Hamas. They assaulted him with knives and axes. In 1994, his Israeli boss paid for his surgery in Tel Hashomer Hospital in Tel Aviv. Thank God. You know, Gamzul et Tova, it was perfect. Because thanks to the surgery he had in Tel Aviv, we were able to find the Israeli doctor who treated him. And here is what he said. So now we have solved the problem about the father. So the father did not receive bullets in front of friends to cameramen. So now the last question is, what happened to Mohammed? Was he shot and killed in front of friends to cameramen? So you remember, I told, sorry, we, I told you about the 18 minutes that we got at the court. So what you will see now is our 10 seconds after the boy was supposedly shot and killed. So please, he's dead now, according to friends too. Let's watch it. So there are three interesting things to see here. First you will see that the boy is raising his elbow, turning his face towards the cameraman. You can see the face of the father, and you can see that the boy, according to them, he's dead, but he has his foot up. 
I'm sure that if you find any medical doctor, he will tell you that it is not possible. But let's watch it again. He raises his elbow, puts it down, look at the father, and look at the foot up. Kind of. You said it. Okay. So now let's listen to the father, what he said when he was at the hospital. The first bullet hit him in the right knee. So the first bullet hit him in the right knee. Remember, right knee, very important. Mohammed wurde zuerst am rechten Bein getroffen und das zweite Geschoss trat aus dem Rücken aus. Ich glaube, es waren insgesamt drei Schüsse. So he said that Mohammed was shot on the right leg. It's okay with the right knee. Then one bullet came in and went out on his back, and the third bullet probably. So let's listen to Charles and Dolin. We got uh, the picture of Mohammed that you are born in the morgue of uh, Shifa Hospital. The wounds look to me consistent with the shooting that happened that day. The kid was not shot from there. There's a wound in the back, he's an exit. So he said he has picture of the morgue of Gaza and he said that there was an exit wound. So he repeats the same thing, that a bullet came out on the back of the boy. So he said that he had a picture of the morgue of Gaza. Of course, as you may know, Gaza is a very dangerous place, so we have pictures of the morgue of Gaza. Let's watch them and listen carefully and remember the boy was shot on the right knee or on the right leg. Listen to the doctor. Following the examination, it was clear that the bullet entered the body from the front and from above. The bullet entered the body in the abdomen and exited the body here. This wound was fatal. The second injury lies just beneath the chest and the bullet exited through the left hip bone. This wound was also fatal because it shredded major blood vessels. The third injury in the left leg was relatively harmless. We have kind of a problem here. The doctor who got the body said that the exit, I think he had two exit bullets, two bullets which came out and went out from the back, but he also has a left leg injury. And the father told about the right leg, so there is something strange here. Maybe we're not talking about the same kid. And when you take a look at the last picture, you remember when the boy was killed, raised his, rose his elbow to look at the camera and kept his foot up. You can see his back. The two bullets which went out on the back, we can't see any single drop of blood, nor on the wall. So now I'd like you to see what it looks like when someone gets only one exit wound on the back. Okay, this is one exit wound. But the boy with two exit wounds, no blood, nowhere. So we have a problem, you remember, so a problem with the right knee and the left leg. And if you remember, at the beginning of the news report, he said that everything starts at 3 p.m. and he said that the shooting lasts for 45 minutes. So let's take a look at what the doctor who got the body at the hospital, what does he say about what happened when he got the body of Mohammed? Und was wissen wir in unserer Mohammed-Tradition? Den zweiten Ausgang zufolge kann der Krankenwagen bei Mohammed und Jamal al dura frühestens gegen halb vier hier im Schifa-Krankenhaus in Gaza angekommen sein. Der diensthabende Arzt erinnert sich auch an die Eigenlieferung eines toten Kindes, aber nicht um halb vier. Es war gegen zehn Uhr. Ich war in der Intensivstation der Notaufnahme für die Schwerverletzten. Zeitgleich, innerhalb einer Minute, wurden zwei Personen eingeliefert. Eine war ein Kind. Hinterher erfuhr ich, dass es Mohammed Jamal al war. Um 10 Uhr, als wir Dr. Tafil Mohammed al Bura untersucht haben, Das Labor kann nicht sein, denn da waren Vater und Sohn noch gar nicht an der Kreuzung und die Schießerei begann erst gegen 14 Uhr. Okay, so now we have a big problem. The dead body arrives at 10 a.m. in the morning at the doctor. He got him dead. And then at 3 p.m. he's acting alive and he's dead 45 minutes later. And then you have the funeral at 5. So there is a huge problem here. There is, it doesn't work. 
we have different wounds, so the question is there, were there in fact two boys? So we ask this question to a biometrician. The biometrician is someone who compares the face. He compared the face of the guy at the morgue and the guy at the funeral and the boy who was filmed in the Friends 2 News report. And what you can see is that this face at the funerals and at the morgue are the same, but not the one who's filmed by Friends 2. So let's watch it. Um eine Antwort auf diese Frage zu finden, denken wir uns an einen der führenden Experten weltweit. Kurt Kindermann ist Gerichtsgutachter für biometrische Gesichtsvergleiche. Ihm legen wir alle Bilder vor, die Mohammed Al-Dura zeigen sollen. Und dann nimmt man dann in diesem biometrisch-mathematischen Gesichtsvergleich auch immer den Anlauf verglichen. Bei der Beerdigung gehe ich davon aus, dass es der, äh, wir müssen ja auch diese äußerst markante Verletzung im linken Arm und Arm erreicht hat, um diese Verletzung ist deutlich auf dem Operationsbild zu sehen und es ist auch deutlich auf dem Beerdigungsbild zu sehen. Die ist nicht erkennbar auf dem Bild der Einrichtung von auf weitere Merkmale spreche ich dafür, dass es sich bei dem produzierten Kind nicht nur noch an der Treffen macht. Das sieht man ja, dass die Augenbrauen in den Boden verlaufen. Hier sieht man, dass die Flach nach oben nach oben verlaufen. Das ist ein Das ist eine Unsichtbarung. Und der hier ist ein Unsichtbarung. Bei der Erdigungsszene und auf dem Optionstisch anzunehmen, dass es hier bei den Begleitern ist. Aber nicht die in den Fass. Aber nicht die in den Fass, die deutlich mehr zusammenschreiben. Okay, no, we understand. A dead body arrived at 10 a.m. at the hospital. We don't know anything about the death of this boy. Then the cameraman of France who decides to, to, to stage the scene in the afternoon and then they're using the picture of the boy in the morning to pretend that this is a boy in the afternoon. So my claim is that Mohamed Aldar was not shot and killed in front of France 2 cameraman. And I'd like you to take a look at the last seconds of the France 2 raw material. You remember I told you 18 minutes. 17 minutes of nothing, 50 seconds of what you've seen, plus the 10 seconds when the boy raised his elbow. And let's take a look at the, just the following three seconds after he rose his elbow. Isn't there something missing here? The boy and the father are not there anymore. And despite the 15 bullets they went, which went through their bodies, there is not a single drop of blood on the wall. Okay. And what you can also remember is that before, at the beginning of this presentation, I showed you evacuations with the ambulance, you know and filmed by so many cameramen and they were filming fake evacuations. So why aren't they filming this true evacuation according to them? So it's completely ridiculous. And this is another evidence of the staging. So my claim is that the French News report is a stage hoax. I would like just before concluding to know if there is someone or some people in this room who don't believe that it's a hoax. Don't believe what? don't believe that it's a hoax. Is there are some people here who, don't have, who do not believe it's a hoax, it's a fabricated story? No? Okay. So, just to summarize it, you have a boy and a father who pretentiously received 15 bullets, but not a single drop of blood. You have a dead boy who raised his elbow, like this, and a father who's quite smiling. Why is it so important? It's because you have monuments like this all over the world. And you have two decisions of justice which were in my favor. The first one is that I told you, when France to submit for defamation, at the end, at, at the appellate court, I won. I was found not guilty of defamation. But two years ago, there is another French TV, which is a private TV, which is called Canal Plus, which made a documentary, a 52 minutes documentary, in order to support the blood libel and to slander me. So I sued them for defamation because it was terrible for me. And six months ago, they were found themselves guilty of defamation. So I went two court cases which were really supportive of the fact that it's a hoax.
I'd like to conclude with a few ideas. The battle is not over uh, because as you understood, the, the, the Charles and Dolin is still very, very uh, supported in France. I mean, all the French media were supportive of him when he published his book. None of them had agreed to uh, publish my answers or to have a debate with him. Uh, last week, uh, where's Monday? Yes, where Monday. So last week, on Thursday, th four days ago, I was able to have the first TV debate on the Alzheimer case. It was on a Canadian TV. Uh, the Michael Corrin show, I don't know if, you're, if you know this show. So it was the first time I had a debate on this case. But in France, there is no way to debate the case. I'm really considered as a nut case. So the battle is really not over. For the last 10 years, one of the most important obstacles we had in the truth, in having the truth revealed, was that the Israeli government was not willing to support me at all. In Andolin's book, uh, it's written maybe 10 times that he still has the support of the IDF, of the Shin Bet, and that his cameraman is white like snow according to the Shin Bet. So, his cameraman, Charles, the Shin Bet, Shabak, the Israeli, uh, uh, I would say CIA, okay, or FB, whatever. So they, this is what he claimed in his book, and for years I've been fighting, and for some friends who are here, they know what I'm talking about, I've been fighting against the Israelis to get them on my side. I could give you the worst example I had, is that four years ago I met the Israeli ambassador in Paris in a cocktail party. I came to say hello, to shake his hand. I stayed like that, he refused to shake my hand. So just that you understand what it has been in terms of Israeli opposition. But finally, Thanks to Charles and Dolding's book, as I said, always Gamzule it, Tova. It really, uh, it was too shocking for them because he was using their silence. It was really, he was really using their silence and their, uh, I would say, their lack of interest of the case to make people believe that he got their support. So finally, three weeks ago, we got a letter of support of the Israeli government coming from the Prime Minister office, and I'll give you afterwards my email if you want to receive all these documents. And it's a very supportive document, and we are working with, for another document which will be very accusatory against France too, and Charles and Dolin. So, if you want to receive some updates, or if you want to receive some information about this in the future, or for example, the link, or receive the document from the Prime Minister office, or to see, receive the link of the Canadian debate, Mm -hmm. It should work. Here is my email. You st just send me short emails, please. Short, because I cannot read after five lines. Short emails. And I'll put you on my friends mailing list and you'll receive the updates. Thank you very much. First, because you have to understand that Charles Anderlin is a very, very well-connected guy. Uh, there is only one doctor in the world who agreed to testify, to testify in favor of Charles Anderlin recently. His name is Rafi Valden, and his uh, family life is that he's a... S Sorry? Sorry? Thank you. He is, he is the son-in-law of Shimon Peres. So the, the son-in-law of Shimon Peres has been testifying in favor of the blood libel. He also has, for example, Israel Hassan, who's a guy who's a member of Kadima in Israel, a member of the Knesset, and who used to be the second guy in common at the Shin Bet, who testified in his favor. So he, he's very, very well connected. He has friends everywhere. He also has, for example, Igal Palmor, who's one of the spokespersons of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, who's been, when I won the trial, so there was no risk for them, who's been slandering me in the media and telling that I was kind of a nutcase. So, you know, he has lots of connection there. And it's not only on the left-hand side, on the right-hand side, because Igal Palmor is someone from the right-hand side. It's from everywhere. He's very, very well connected. And you also have to understand that in Israel, they don't understand what is anti-Semitism. They just don't understand what we're fighting in the diaspora. It's for them, it's, com it's a concept which is, uh, it's, not, it's not concrete, it's an abstraction for them. 
and when they travel abroad. I can give you, for example, the example that I had with T.P. Livni a year, almost two years ago when there was a cast-led operation in Gaza. I was in Israel and I had the opportunity, I don't say the chance, but the opportunity to meet T.P. Livni. And I asked her, look, I want the trial in the court. It's very easy for you. It's like the check, you just need to cash it at the bank. You know, it's a victory for you against the media, the Western media. And she said, hi, we don't care about that. This is not important. A year later, the son of Mohammed al Dura, the Goldstone Report, which is really the son of 10 years of lies, okay, came out, and she was prevented from entering England because she was accused of war crimes. I was so happy that it happened to her. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry, because she could really smell the taste of the medicine now, because she really, that's it, it's important for them to understand. And now, for a year and a half, I had very, very hard difficulties to enter, to penetrate the Benjamin Netanyahu's uh, environment, establishment. And re just a month ago I was able to make a presentation for them that they will really understand. So it's very, very difficult. I have a question. I may How have did a you handle uh, Andrew, the publishing of Enderlin's book? Sorry? How are you going to handle the publishing of Enderlin's book now? It's starting all over again. Okay, so I'm going to tell you um, how we're handling this. It's a very important and very useful tool because you know where you're playing poker, what you're wondering is what does he have in his game? And he's put, he has put everything in 200 pages. And you can see that after 10 years of this story, he doesn't have any single evidence of, the, of his accusation. So for us, that's very comfortable. And people who read the book, who are honest, think, Wait, wait a minute, we're reading this book, he's just talking about his suffering of having a, being accused of having a broadcast a fake news report. But he's not bringing a single evidence. His only evidence are, first, I have the support of the IDF, Israeli army, and from the Shin Bet, the Israeli secret services. And second, how can you imagine that we would stage a scene in the middle of a war? And we're first... First, we brought the, thing, the evidence that there was no war that day that it was staged. And the second thing now, we, they don't have, he doesn't have any more the support of the Israeli army and nor of the Israeli government. So it's very, very good for us. You know, we're working for history. We're not working for the New York Times or for the LA Times or tomorrow. We're working really for the next decade. So it's a big step forward for us to have had this book. And it's very useful because it was a tool for us which helped us wake them up. The book is, is only in French right now, right? The book is only in French. Uh, last week, as I told you, he was awarded a prize. It's a bestseller in France. It's everywhere. I mean, he's been everywhere in the media. It's everywhere in the shops. So I can tell you, you'll have it in English pretty soon. You'll know much more about me. Are you a French citizen? I am a French citizen. Only I'm a French elected official. Uh, I was elected two years ago as a deputy mayor of Neuilly, which is a city where Nicolas Sarkozy was a mayor. Uh, that's it. Was there any effort to locate the son? Yes. Yeah. Uh, no. Well, some people try to find the son or say, we've seen him here. This is not important because even if you bring someone here and who say, hello, I'm Mohamed al -Dura. I'm uh, 22 years old, I've been living in LA for the last 10 years. <laughs> And, uh, you know, I've been undercover because it was too dangerous for me in L.A. Nobody would believe you. If some people can believe that someone got 15 bullets and they don't bleed, they're not human beings. You know, it's, I, I'm sure you're going to love this. If you send me this email, I'll send you the link of the Canadian debate. And the, there was a guy from uh, a Canadian news, a journalist working for Al Jazeera. So insane. And uh, what they call a Palestinian Christian living in... Um, uh, living in Canada, and I asked him, but just explain me, 15 bullets and no blood. And he told me, that's, that's normal. The, because the guy was so afraid, they were so afraid that their, I don't know the word he used, but their blood was um, frozen, frozen, so there was no blood. <laughs> I swear to God, send me the link, it's amazing. So, you know, you're dealing not, we're not dealing with, you're not dealing with facts, you're dealing with, with faith, you know. Their faith is that this is true. And you know something, there is something strange which, which tells you a lot about these people who pretend that they're pro-Palestinian. It tells you that they're not pro-Palestinian at all, because if I were pro-Palestinian, I would be so happy to hear that a dead boy was not dead. 
I mean, they really love the Palestinians. They would be so happy. Oh, thank God, this boy was not killed, you know. It's because they hate Israel. And when they hate Israel, it's just because it's anti-Semitism. Just that. There is nothing else. Don't try to talk yet, but it's anti-Zionism. It doesn't exist. I've never seen someone who's anti-Nicaragua or anti-China. I mean, anti-China again, but sometimes. But, you know, anti-Nicaragua. You understand what I mean? You understand what I mean? But nobody wants to destroy the state of China. You know, you can be anti You understand what I mean? Yes. Okay. Sorry. I thought you were making fun of me. There was a similar incident about a month ago, about in the junction. You know about the one that happened at the junction? In Silwan, yeah. You, you saw that? Yeah. They said they hit purposely hit a boy. Yeah. Yeah, this is the same thing going on. And that we need to speak out. Yeah, okay. okay. Okay, but this one is the most... This is the worst. This, this is the worst blood libel which has ever been created. Right. Since the creation of the media, I mean, since the creation of the state of Israel, there has never been such an ugly blood libel. I mean, so this is why we need to fight against that one. And the one which has been uh, until one didn't make such big noise. I'm not the boss of the microphone. <laughs> Wait, if you pardon me for just making a quick statement before I ask you a question. Uh, I, I think that the most extraordinary part of this entire case is that this whole incident came from France Lou, a Western democracy. This isn't a story that came from Al Jazeera. And I'd like to personally thank you in front of everybody in this room for not being a journalist, but being a stockbroker. You fought this case for 10 years, it's one battle. Keep your microphone because you're about Round after round after round. I think it's just extraordinary. extraordinary. Two quick questions. First no, of one after the other one. I cannot because I already, I already forgot what you said at the beginning. So. Uh, the, the American Jewish I, I can just correct you. I did fight for ten years. I fought for eight years because I entered two thousand two. You're going to be more than ten in two years from now. I hope so. <laughs> I, no, I, I don't. I hope I will. I would have won before. Uh, I know at one time the American Jewish Committee in France wasn't too supportive of your fight. <laughs> Was this uh, just in France? Was it the international movement? Was this David Harris uh, nationally, uh, internationally? Has their position changed at all? Okay, look, David Harris has been um, manipulated by his representative in Paris, whose name is Valerie Hoffenberg. She's been a friend of mine since I was 15 years old. I'm 44, so we've been old friends. She's not even been my girlfriend, so it's not something you know personal. Um, and she understood that in order to penetrate the French political system, she had to be against me because I was really fighting against the French establishment. So she decided and she went all her way to say, Carsanti is a liar, Carsanti is an ad case, don't listen to Carsanti. And it went very well, very well for her, and she manipulated David Harris. I came to David Harris many times, I asked him, I sent him. Uh, pe even people from LA to ask him, please change, change your attitude, don't support her. And he never wanted because he trusted her. From what I understand, you know, now she left the office of the American Jewish Committee and the new person that they appointed is supportive of me. So that's good. I have no more problem with that. But Valerie Hoffenberg, who, who was uh, the one who's been really damaging me for years, and I published her against her and David Harris in the Jerusalem Post and in other newspaper. Um, yesterday we had a new government. Yesterday we had a French new government, you know. And Le Monde published an article in the morning saying that she would be probably appointed as a minister yesterday. I started to get text messages I could send them. Ah, she's going to be appointed. Ah, you're worse than me. And thank God she was not appointed. To, we had a government yesterday night. So, look, I would say the crime doesn't pay. <laughs> and, uh, you know, she did it for her personal career. I don't even, I'm not even against her, you know. I've been uh, through her. I mean, we, we know that we're fighting for the truth. And she knows deeply in her heart that she's uh, fighting against the, the Jewish people. So, now, when it comes to the American Jewish Committee, I'm sure that they understood that they made a mistake. They still have the possibility to change them because David Harris has a very nice, good access to Nicolas Sarkozy, but he, dev he didn't use his access to change the perception that he had. I hope one day he will make it. Did the UN investigate this case? <laughs> no. 
No. Yes. What about the, uh, when the military shoots civilians or alleged to shoot civilians? It's usually an investigation. Was there any kind of investigation by the IDF? Or, uh, do you know anything about Look, uh, the. Um, I know that the IDF have a very poor investigation, a uh, very, very poor investigation, and they, at the end they came two months later with a conclusion that the boy was not shot by them, but they were so uh, unsure about themselves, they were so, they were not confident, you know, the investigation was very poor. And uh, I can give you an example, you know, I guess in two weeks you're going to have Boogie Yalon, who's going to be in, in LA. Okay, and Boogie Yalon, Moshe Yalon will be in LA in two weeks. And Moshe Yalon at that time was uh, chief of staff. Well, you might have a question about the response that you're getting um, from some of the universities um, that you've spoken at. I know that you've spoken at in the past um, about your story. You could just call them American schools. Right, what's the question? What kind of response are you getting at the universities when you show them this video? Well, I never had it. Look, it never. I've been lecturing this for many years, oh, as I told you, all over the world. I never had any contestation from anyone. Uh, I mean, I had some people who asked questions, said, I'm not convinced, and I asked them why. Then we went further, but I never had anyone who was able to find any discrepancy in the demonstration. So. Uh, we're moving forward. It's, uh, but you know, I would tell you something. After 10 years, the guy published his book, and there is not a single evidence. You know, it's obvious. And you know, it's, it's just a question now of uh, common sense. I mean, 15 bullets, no blood. Just find me one medical doctor, apart from the sunny love Shimon Peres, but find me just one, a serious medical doctor, who can say, yes, that's true. Can I ask you, uh, do you contend that there's there was an active conspiracy among France do with the... Arab Keep your microphone close to your microphone. Sorry. Do you contend that there was an active conspiracy by the French? Or do you contend that the French were deceived? There is never a conspiracy. And I'm telling you something. When you're looking in a case between conspiracy and stupidity, always find stupidity. There is no conspiracy in this case. I'm telling you something. The 800 journalists who signed the petition against me, they are not conspirators. They are just stupid people who are just saying, oh, Charles Andolin is such a great guy and Constantine is such an asshole. So we're signing for Charles Andolin. You know, it's obvious. That's it. And then, Charles Andolin, he may have made a mistake at the beginning. Maybe he, he didn't look precisely to the film that he received. But Ten years after, after the fact that he never got a single evidence of this thing, I think he knows that he's lying. But um, there is never a conspiracy. You know, people are telling me, so how can you imagine, how can you um, explain that despite all that, all these people who were inside the conspiracy in Gaza, none of them have spoken. But look, there is not a single French journalist who had agreed to publish or to say anything against this, and they have seen it. So it's never a conspiracy. It's cowardness and it's stupidity. Billy, um, I noticed that um, your investigative report is, uh, is was made by Germans. Um, they're the last people, I think, who would probably support us. Do you have any idea why these Germans got together, oh, yeah. journalists, and decided to, to broadcast Okay. Uh, make this investigative journalist report. Okay. Well, I fully disagree with you because I understand that Germans know exactly what it, where it takes when you're creating anti-Semitism. You know, inciting against the Jews, they know exactly where it take them, where it took them. So I think this is why they're more sensitive. The first thing which attracted my attention was eight years ago that this German TV made a documentary, and the conclusion was that the boy was not killed by the Israelis. And then after I investigated further, and then I understood with the other people that it was staged. But then the, the, the pictures that you've seen from them are coming from their second documentary when they've been following me and when they've been agreeing that it was staged. But I must tell you, the Germans are much better when it comes to anti-Semitism than almost any other nation. I have a quick comment about the blood that I want to bring up. You can correct me if I'm wrong, but I have read that the body of the boy that supposedly Muhammad al-Dura had an eight-inch wound 
his abdomen that was not at all consistent with a bullet wound that was so severe that his entrails were literally outside the body. Uh, I didn't see any of that in the photo. I mean, wouldn't that be incredibly obvious if that were the body of... Uh, You're right. That's, Okay, but again, we're talking, you know, we're talking about faith. When people tell you 15 bullets, that's okay, their blood was frozen. This is why you don't see blood. I mean, <laughs> what can you say? I mean, a dead boy does this. Okay, I mean, that's okay. I mean, uh... that, that was actually my rhetorical question. My real question is, what do you think was in the nine minutes that was removed from the test? Don't care. I don't care. You know, I mean, I, I care for fun. But in this case, I'm not wasting time with something which is not useful. Here, what is useful is to prove that it's a hoax and to convey the message. I agree with you, it, would be, it must be very funny to see these nine minutes. But you know what he said in his book, how he explains the nine minutes, the nine minutes which are missing? He said, well, when we got the raw material, we thought it was 27, we put it in the safe for like the seven years. And seven years ago, when the judge asked us, we took the, the tape and we realized on the 18 it, it shrank, you know, like <laughs> frozen. <laughs> In the film you showed uh, there were a lot of guns going off. What, whose guns? Who was firing at, at that time? Okay, so you mean the noise? Okay, from what we understand, some people have analyze this sound and say no it's coming from Kalashnikov because it's coming from machine guns and what you can see is that Israeli don't use machine guns at all but we've not, I mean the ballistic expert wrote a little bit about that but we really asked him to investigate into, you know he reconstructed the scene in Paris, I mean in the suburb of Paris with this concrete wall and everything because we really wanted to have the bullet holes, what it looks like when it's coming from the angle or from a perpendicular shooting but you're right, there's, you know, there are much more, I mean, I have not shown you everything, as I told you. For example, we had, uh, we had, we had to use uh, an Arab who's deaf, who cannot uh, hear and, and, and who's mute, because we had to read the lips of the father when he's talking. And he's talking to the guy behind the cameraman, and he's telling him to stop shooting. Okay? okay. So we have all this kind of evidence that we have, you know. We have more and more and more and more and more. But for them, not a single... That's absurd. And now it's not a question of evidence, it's a question of, of faith, you know. When they will stop believing in, the, in their absurd story, narrative. Um, as, a, as a former Soviet Union citizen, I understand what anti-Semitism means. And I understand that you fight anti-Semitism. This movie is just one of the parts of your fight. And uh, my question to you, how French academia and youth um, relate to Israel? Because I am very disappointed with academia in the United States. Even Jewish professors, they are against Israel. I want to know if in France the same. You will see. Well. It's not about, you know, as always, it's not about the academics. In France, the most important people are the, the journalists. Uh, they, oh, they have the power. And when you're talking about Soviet Union, I, say, I would say something. You know, we say in France that the difference between Soviet Union, I'm talking, the difference between Soviet Union and France is that France is a communist country which works. Okay? And the big difference is that when you lived in USSR, when you were reading La Pravda, the Pravda, you knew that it was full of lies. In France, people read Le Monde or Le Figaro and believe this is the truth. That's the main problem. You understand? So the main problem is not with academics, even though the academics are a big problem, but with the media. And I'd like to tell you something very important. In the French media, the most prominent people, many of them are Jews. You know, many of them are Jews, but they are the worst Israel bashers that we have. And this is the price they pay to keep their position. So then after, and Charles Andalini is a Jew, French Israeli Jew. Then after, you know, when he criticized Israel so badly, then when any other Jones come afterward and say something even weaker, you cannot accuse him of being anti-Semitic, you understand? So it's very, very subtle. I'd like to first thank you for your presentation.
for everything that Thank you've you. done and will continue to do. I wanted to know if you have been successful in getting media exposure, either on TV or on the talk uh, radio shows in the United States. Never on TV. I mean, apart from Pajamas TV, which is a nice TV, and um, but not on the mainstream uh, media. Uh, some radio talk show. I'm very close to Dennis Prager. He's a good friend of mine. I'm having a, an after lunch tomorrow with him. He's been interviewing me uh, many times. Uh, but I mean, the fir I, I tell something. The first really interesting debate was four days ago in Canada. At the Michael Current, you'll see it's really interesting. It's the first time I was able to argue with anyone about this. Hello, Philippe. Thank you for your presentation. Um, was there or has there ever been any kind of footage where those bullet holes in the wall were created in front of the camera? Any footage of what? Of, 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 of those bullet holes in the wall were created during the filming. Only one. One bullet hole is created during the film, which is one which is at the top. The only bullet hole which is filmed, that's it. And you can see clearly that it's a round bullet hole. All the other one were filmed, never filmed, and the camera pretended that he was just in front of them, you know. So, so, so they existed before the police? We don't know what happened. I mean, the ballistic experts said that there is no evidence that the bullets which were shot, were shot when the boy and the father were there. But even we don't care, I mean, eight bullet holes, all of them round bullet holes, when you know that Israeli were only in the Israeli camp and tells you that it's absurd. Um, I just wanted to mention that 518 years ago, there was a flood libel in Spain in 1491. Following that, they were preparing for the expulsion of the Jews. There was no body found. They said that the body went straight to heaven. There was absolutely no proof. But sadly, this is taught still in Spain. It is believed by the Spanish church and it's taught in all the schools in Spain to this day, 518 years later. And I think this is very similar to the pairing of the Intifada that follow, you know, everything that happened, Daniel Pearl, etc. This is an excuse. Look, they did this, even though there's no proof, and this is what we're going to return to them. And it's very similar. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, uh, the first blood libel, if I can say, I mean, uh, it came uh, I mean, before and before and before. I mean, we had blood libels since uh, creation of the Jewish people, always trying to slander the Jews, and this is why we need to fight. I mean, this blood libel that you're mentioning in Spain, uh, is not world famous, but this one is world famous. I just, I just wanted to ask you about the French Jews when all this was going on, when you had your, um, uh, your trial. Did the French Jews, there's what, three quarters of a million Jews living in France, did they stand up for you? Did they say anything? You know, what about... Uh, Look, uh, I would say the French Jews, regular French Jews like you and me, they were, most of them were very supportive. But they didn't know because they didn't have access to the information. I mean, the red Jewish radios, uh, most of them would never uh, invite me. And the only one who invited me, uh, I decided two years ago not to go anymore on the radio show. Uh, and you would say it's stupid, but uh, why I decided not to go anymore? It's because two years ago for their annual dinner, their guest of honor was a French two lawyer who was... Uh, defending Charles, I mean, attacking me on the name of Charles and Ellie at the trial. So I said, look, I cannot attend any more to your, any of your show because you're, you've been inviting as a guest of honor the guy who's been accusing me of being kind of a Holocaust denier. So I will not. So no, uh, the establishment doesn't like it so much because it's rocking the boat. But, 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 I must say that the president of the CRIF, which is a French Jewish umbrella organization, has been very supportive of me and he paid a very high price in the media because of his support. So I understand why it could be difficult for some uh, Jewish leaders to f fight for the truth. First I want to thank you for your, your presentation tonight and I'm glad to say that I'm a very good friend of Yosef Duriel. Ah, good. Yeah. So you'll tell him that I mention him nicely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, because he's a, no. It's I, I must insist on something. You know, I'm sorry, just to interrupt you, but Yosef Doriel is a decent man. 
He's a man who founded the Israeli the, uh, Air Force. I mean, he's a, one of the men who founded the Israeli Air Force. He came from Russia when he was 17 years old. And when you read the book of Charles Underlin, he's completely a nutcase. You know, they claim that he pretended that um, uh, Begin was drugged to sign the Camp David Agreement, you know, in 1970. So he drives, he, he presents him as a completely crazy man. And Yosef Zayel will probably sue Charles Underlin, you know. So I think it's very important to, just even for all these people who have been slandered, it's important to, to put this thing straight on. My question is to you, when are you planning to write a book? I'm writing a book. I'm writing a book. Um, I'm glad I've never published a book before. I'm glad, why? Because as I said, you know, when you're playing a game, it's a game now, you know, it's really a game. What you bring, what do I bring? Now I have all of their documents. And now, you know, I've been lecturing for all these years in order to put the pressure. My objective was to be able to put the pressure on the French government and on the Israeli government, which was against me for so many years. Now that we're getting the Israeli on board, and probably soon we're going to be able to put pressure on the French, I will stop lecturing all over the world and finish my book, but I've been already working a lot of it. And uh, it, it's really important to put the things on the table, but I'm a perfectionist, you know, I really want to have it there. I, because if I hadn't read the book, read the book of Andalin now, I would have written things which are not accurate. Because I didn't know exactly what was his thinking of some points. Um, the young lady sitting next to me mentioned the blood libel and the fact that it followed, following that there was an expulsion of Jews from Spain. And uh, in addition to the precipitation of the Intifada after this, um, there was the expulsion of Jews from Gush Katif. I was in Netzarim and you mentioned about the Israeli government and why somebody said, why would the Israeli government not cooperate with you? But it was important for uh, to, for them to, for the world also to um, not want uh, the Israelis to be in that, in that region. To be what? To be in Gush Katif. No, but what the, I, that, okay, look, again, I never believe in, in uh, conspiracies. I'll tell you something, in Israel, I have big problem with some of the people with Shalom Akshav, peace now. But I have fantastic allies in Haaretz, for example. I have a journalist whose name is uh, Reuven Pedetsur, who's a uh, guy voting for Meretz, who's a fantastic guy who published a very nice article a year ago where he said that uh, the Aldera hoax is the worst PR uh, failure of the Israeli authorities. So don't try to put it, uh, it's politically oriented. Of course, we know that people from Shalom Arshav, most of them are against this, because for them this is good, because when they depict uh, the Israelis who are living uh, where the place where they don't want to see them, uh, they are happy because like this, they believe that it will help them to take them out, to make the ethnic cleansing, if you think. You understand what I'm meaning? Okay. Uh, but the point is that the truth has no right or left. Again, I mean, Israel Hassan, before being in Kadima, I think he was in, uh, in uh, Israel Beteinu with uh, Avigdor Lieberman. A year ago, I met Avigdor Lieberman. I had dinner with him. I tried to, in, to educate him about the case. I spent time with his chief of staff, with a big team of his team, and not of, his, uh, of his ministry, and none of them was willing to work with me. So don't put it, make it political. We have allies on the right, on the left, everywhere. I can give you a name of, some of, the, some of someone who's been supportive of me, which is incredible. His name is Eli Barnavi. I don't know if you know who's Eli Barnavi. Eli Barnavi is an extreme leftist who was Israeli ambassador to Paris and who started a group in France, which is a sister company of J Street. It's called J. Cole. And this guy who started this is one of my strongest supporters in, in Europe. So. You, you, why? Because he's a, he believes in what he says. He believes in, uh, in J Street or J. Cole or whatever, and he believes in the truth. And he's seen that, and he says, of course, it's a hoax. So, and as soon as we'll try to make it a partisan issue, we'll, we'll lose the case. It's a non-partisan issue. The truth is the truth. There is nothing else than the truth. We're fighting for the truth. We're not fighting for the right or the left. And you know why it's a big problem to have the truth revealed? I'm going to tell you. Because it's a general issue. 
It's a general interest. There is no private interest which has to win anything from this case. Nobody has to win. Most of them have to lose. Why? Because I'm telling you, a guy who's working at the cabinet of Benjamin Netanyahu, who's been one of my worst opponents, worst opponent, I won't give his name because he doesn't need it. This guy was 10 years ago working at Dover Tal, the spokesperson of the IDF. And when Charles Anderlin got his material, he called this guy when at that time he was a spokesperson. And he said, uh, I think I have something difficult for the IDF. You should come and watch it. And the guy said, I don't care. Well, you should come and see because it's a very problematic for you. He said, I don't care. You just can't say that the Israelis, other Arabs, are making a cynical use of children and women. And the main problem is that this guy has been covering his mistakes for the, last, for the past years. You understand what I mean? So it's a non-partisan issue. It's a really a problem that there is no private interest which has anything to gain. It's just for the good of the state of Israel, for the good of the Western world, for the good of the Jews, and even for the good of France. Because I'm a French elected official. I'm a French elected. I'm not Israeli at all. I don't speak Hebrew at all. I'm French, okay? And as a French, knowing that my TV, my public TV, my government it has broadcast such a lie and that it is covered by so many other lies and by so many people in front that we cannot get the truth out, it's a problem for the French democracy more than anything else. I've been reading about you for years and my question is this. How do you have the fortitude, the inner fortitude to go on and to me, when I was reading about you, it seemed like a moment battle. Obviously, you have allies, but how do you do that? <laughs> how, do, how do you have the fortitude to continue? Well, on? I, 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 you know, I, I think it's a question of a. I, I think it's normal. You know, it's when you have the truth in your pocket. You know, I remember a very. I mean. Sometime I was in disarray, you know, at some point I was really disappointed that I was really, I felt really sad. You know, I remember when I met the Israeli ambassador, when he refused to shake my hand. I was shocked. I was shocked. And some people around me told me, okay, now forget it. You know, you understand that you're wrong. I mean, the guy knows much better than you do. You're wrong. I say, no, the truth, the truth, the truth. So I think, you know, nobody can fight against the truth. Nobody. The truth will always prevail. It, stay, it takes time because we have obstacles, but at the end, the truth wins. So it's not, it's not me, it's the case which is stronger. The pictures, I mean, this picture, picture speaks from the, for themselves. I can take whatever. I mean, my flight is in two days. <laughs> Hello, I'm just curious, uh, were these two people taken to an Israeli hospital or was it an Arab hospital? Because when you come into a hospital and you're ill or wounded, record is kept of what, no, what the, the okay. wounds and whether they're new or old. Okay. There would have been blood and that would have been written up. I can answer you if you want. So they were, both of them were taken to the Shifa hospital in Gaza. They claimed that the boy went to the morgue and that he was killed and then he went to the funerals. And the father, uh, they claimed that the father went, was trying, you know the boss of the father who paid for his surgery in Tel Ashomer, as soon as he saw the pictures on TV, he invited, he offered to the father to be treated in, uh, in Tel Aviv hospital. But the father refused, and the, the PA, the Palestinian Authority, refused, and they took him in the hospital in Amman, which doesn't make sense. I mean, you know, if he was really severely injured, 12 bullets, I mean, quite difficult. And they're lying and more lies. You know, they pretend, for example, that the father was transported in, in Jordan the day after, October 1st. But we have the records, and we have, we have seen that he entered only Jordan because we have the record of the border on October 4th. So all of these are forged. You know, the, doctor, the medical record that they, that they falsified at the hospital in Amman was dated of October 1st. But we know he was October 1st in Gaza still. You know, so more lies, more lies, more. I mean, you know, they're adding lies to lies to lies. And they say, oh, okay, but 
you're believing that the king of Jordan was a part of the conspiracy because of course the king of Jordan when he saw this on TV went in the hospital of Jordan to, to shake the hand of the father but do you think that he went under the sheets to see oh is it real or not I mean everybody believed that it was true I believed it was true I was under shock like everybody so he just he just told him go and shake the hand okay they go and shake the hand Could you um, make any suggestions as to, for us, the public, now that we know the truth, what do you expect us to do in support of you? First, okay, look, uh, uh, we are in a situation now we, we need to be a stronger force. You know, some of you here in this room receive some of my emails. The more I have people in my mailing list and the more you will spread the message, the more powerful we'll be. When you'll come and meet uh, uh, Moshe Yalan, when he's going to come in two weeks, it's very important to make him understand that you support him, that you're with him, and that for you it's important. Because if you make it important, you'll give him strength. Here, I'll speak, I think, I don't know if it's tomorrow, in two days, for, uh, with the, I'm invited by the Israeli consulate to speak here uh, in, a, I don't know which university, one of the, I don't know if it's Riverside of University of South California. USC, okay. Southern. Okay, so this is very important that when you'll meet Jacob Dayan, you'll tell him that it's very important. Why I'm telling you that? Because the experience I had with the Israeli ambassador in Paris was terrible. I can give you other experience with some other ambassadors who were terrible, horrible. So it's very important to uh, say thank you to the people who are taking the right decisions. I think it's very, very important. And uh, we should... You know, for years I've been fighting with negative actions, meaning I've been destroying the obstacles. You know, when Hoffenberg, the girl working for the AGC, was an obstacle, I shot at the AGC. I wrote articles in the American, in the American media and in the Jerusalem Post to attack David Harris and uh, to attack Hoffenberg. At this stage, I don't need to attack anyone. We just need, we have allies now. We're becoming mainstream. As we are becoming mainstream, we need to attract and to to, to praise the people who are on the right side. Forget about the wrong ones. You understand what I mean? And with the positive action, we'll make it happen very easy. E not easily, but earlier. Clear? Thank you. I think we're going to wrap it up. Um, if, if anybody doesn't get Philippe's email address, you can email me, and I'll get it to him. Or if you have friends who aren't here tonight, and would like to be on his email address, get it to me and I will get it to Philippe. And thank you very much. Thank for you being very much.